My name is Michael Shepherd. Um, I've come here today to look at the mining museum which is representing an industry that flourished once in South Derbyshire. I came to Burton in 1983, I came from Nottinghamshire and in the 1960s I worked uh, in the pits in the number six area. Coming into South Derbyshire uh, I knew that uh, over time there'd been a flourishing industry but regrettably I couldn't see um, any remnant of the mining industry and I was not aware that there was a small museum based at uh, Gresley Hall. However, reading the local paper, I read that um, they were opening a museum, a mining museum, at the Conkers uh, Recreational Centre in the National Forest. So here I am today to look at it and after having a brief wander around, it brings back so many memories. You only have to glance at the plates on the wall looking at Ellis Town, South Leicester Colliery, New uh, Lount Colliery, Desford Colliery to realise how many collieries there were in this area and the number of people that must have worked in those collieries and the, and the industries that um, survived or flourished um, working alongside them. And I have so many memories of the mining industry and so pleased that they've actually bought it, uh, this museum, so that the public can uh, look and have some idea of the uh, conditions, uh, the depth of the business, um, and some of the, uh, some of the collection that's been retained by the uh, members who set up the Mining Preservation Group. I'm looking at this uh, display cabinet here and of course anyone who's been in the mining industry would know that the tally board was extremely important because if you went underground um, you had to have tallies. One tally to go underground and when you came out of the pit you gave that tally back. So if there was an incident underground they would count the number of tallies uh, which would tell them how many men were still underground and how many men had come onto the surface. Um, so that was a means of identifying the numbers of people in the pit at the time. There are lots of things here that bring back memories to me working in the coal mines. Although I wasn't a, a collier, I was a technician, um, it was always a hands-on job. You always helped each other and this was a recollection I had of mining was the uh, comradeship, the, the, the way you used to work together as a team and you know nowadays in any business people talk about teamwork and certainly in the pits uh, there was a lot of teamwork. You know I'm looking at this one here, this uh, the exploders, um, the little demon shot exploder, this one here, the, the deputies or the uh, shot firers carried those, they carried the detonators in the pouch here and you know all this, these sort of things, I haven't seen these um, since the 1970s when I left the, when I left the pit. And of course I remember the old phones here, anything that was underground was, a big, was very clunky, it was, it had to be clunky because it was fireproof. Um, and, you know, this, many of the time I've had to speak to people while I've been underground through this type of phone. So that's, that brings back memories to me. And the picture here of the, what they call the pals, the, the uh, he wouldn't have been a, doubtful, if he might have been a collier, I don't know. Uh, he might have been the ganger the guy who led the horses, the pit ponies down. And, you know, this was, I remember very fondly, the pit ponies, because as a young mining entrant, um, I often handled pit ponies, uh, which were used as the, as the main haulage carrier for taking stuff down to a coal face or onto a face that was being developed. 
and the safety boots and the safety gear here, a mixture of all sorts of things with the, the how Russian, a Russian miner's lamp, which I find quite surprising. So this is obviously someone's, it's come from a collection. And looking at the paintings here that uh, obviously someone has some vivid recollections of working at the mine and some of the machinery that I'd never seen this sort of machinery between 1960 and 1970 because there, the area that I worked in was probably a little bit different to this area. In fact, a lot of coal mines um, varied quite dramatically in um, the amount of space you'd got to work. Fortunately, I never came across the rescue team, the mines rescue service. Um, if they were called out, then there would be something serious, and they did a very good job. And their expertise is renowned, and they were called to incidents uh, outside of the UK um, to help um, other pits uh, where they've got a disaster. And the only time I can remember them being called out was at um, uh, was it Aberfan in Wales where the um, the spoil tips collapsed uh, over the school. They did a great job. It's quite amazing how people have managed to collect some of these artifacts. Some of them obviously quite old and some of them very modern. And they've even included items from outside of the pit. The shunter's lamp, because every pit um, had their own railway network and the wagons would come in uh, empty uh, to the coal preparation plant and I can remember the number of trains that came in and out of the collieries I worked in. It's the first time I've actually seen uh, photographs of um, like we have here the trainees and tutors that's from 1950 to 1955. Very rarely seen underground underground pictures and this is interesting, when you look at Donis Thorpe col uh, colliery from the air, it gives you um, an idea how vast that site was. And when you look at it now, it's, it's all been landscaped. This is the site of, uh, I believe it's Conkers on here, isn't it? Um, and I think it's a tribute to the mining industry that they've actually uh, put the museum here at the site of the colliery. With these photographs I think are important for people who have never been down a coal mine um, and couldn't envisage what it's like and I think it's it's so important to um, let people see um, the conditions that um, we worked under. Now this is quite an interesting um, picture board for me because as mining advanced um, so did the machinery and a lot of these machines that are shown here I'd never, I'd never worked with because as a technician I'd work on uh, a lot of the uh, mining machines, but the road, the Dosco road header, and the joy loader with an arch setter. I've, I've not seen these sort of things before. These sort of machines, all the dint header. So this is quite new to me, and I think this is one of the pleasures of coming to a museum is to see how mining had advanced in those short years that I'd left, and the scale of the machinery. This picture here. I mean, I've never ever worked in a mine that had a coal face as, as high as that. The ones I worked in um, were probably no more than four foot, five foot high. And when you look at the scale of this and the huge machine that's cutting the coal and the guy standing up there, you get an idea of the, the size of that coal seam.
I certainly remember this, the German plough. That was a brute of a machine. The chain here pulled this plough across the coal face, ripping the coal off. Um, I can remember working with that machine and it wasn't that successful uh, where you had bad strata conditions. I'm looking at the happy miners there. I think it was a, it, it was a hard job, there's no doubt about it. But there's a lot of camaraderie spirit and that not only uh, affected you at work but also in the communities that you lived in. And I think it's a shame nowadays that those communities have been split and I think a lot of that camaraderie spirit is gone. And this is interesting because you've got uh, photographs of um, the collieries in the area, Brettby, Church Gresley, Netherfield, Swaddling Coat Colliery. I didn't realise there were so many. And yet there's nothing on the surface now that reminds anyone that there's been a colliery here in this area, which I think is a big shame. And coming on to this, again this is an interesting cabinet, it, this does bring back memories to me. Uh, if you had your, your sandwiches in a, a bag then the mice could get into it or the bag would get crushed and your sandwiches get spoiled. But a lot of people bought snap tins because they kept your food clean, dry and away from the mice. The safety lamp there is, that's the, um, what we used to call the deputy's lamp or the overman's lamp, it's a relightable one. Um, colliers who went, who carried safety lamps, um, their lamp, um, if the flame went out then that was it. But the uh, senior people, the, the deputies, the overman, um, I mean they had lamps that you could relight and they were important because um, uh, the safety lamp was used to determine if gas was present on a, on a, a working face or, or in any, any working area and in order to carry one of those you had to take um, a, a safety lamp gas test and um, once you've, once you've passed that test, you, you were authorised to carry a safety lamp and you could check for gas. But of course, as time developed, they brought electronic devices in for gas testing, um, which did away with the canaries. And uh, to some extent, I think the safety lamp was still retained, but um, modern usage was with electronic gas testing. And of course, the pithead baths, my goodness, anyone who never experienced communal bathing would be quite surprised um, in the days of communal bathing because you'd get, um, you'd be asked to scrub your mate's back for him and he'd scrub your back and, you know, <laughs> there was no good, no good being modest in those days because, um, you know, uh, all types and sizes went together in the, in the, um, baths and um, you know you washed each other to get each other clean and the helmets of course um, I started out with the this uh, the early helmet the black boots I think it was a compressed material um, and then in later on in the 60s um, coloured helmets came in I think it was blue for an electrician and red for a fitter or something like that but um, it came into uh, uh, plastic helmets. And the other thing that struck me, of course, is that uh, so much attention was paid to uh, dust suppression. And uh, in, during the 1960s to the 1970s, we were never given respirators, and dust suppression wasn't really a major um, uh, activity. Um, not so now. Now you've got you've got active dust suppression. You've got respirators, um, and I think all this came, uh, you know, as people understood what was happening in, in terms of health issues. I'm glad I came today because I think this area deserves a museum. It deserves 
attention um, youngsters particularly ought to know about the heritage. It, quite interesting because I went to a, a National Mining Museum uh, in Wakefield uh, some time ago and some children were playing with uh, coal. You've got, you've got a selection of coal here. They were playing with coal and they'd never seen coal before because at home they've got cent gas central heating or oil heating and they, I don't think they could visualise or understand where coal came from or what it was really like. I can remember coal being cut fresh off the coal face. It was black gold and it wasn't until it oxidised that you actually got the black dust on your fingers. But when it's cut straight off the coal face, there's no dust or anything. Um, it glints like gold, black gold we used to call it. Uh, but after that, shortly after that, it oxidised and that's when you got all this black soot on your fingers and used to wipe it on your face, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think it's congratulations to the people who stuck with it um, to form uh, an exhibition of memorabilia. Uh, and I just hope that uh, the youngsters and uh, children understand what the heritage was in this area and it's a big shame that you know, coal mining is no longer a major industry in this country. Well, I've just come to another another display cabinet, and yes, it, this is a, all about the pit ponies. And I can remember the first time that uh, I went to live in the village where the pit was, but it was July and it was the pit fortnight, and the ponies had just been brought out of the pit because that was the only time they came out, was the two, the, the two weeks holiday. And they were jumping up and down in the fields. And when I, when I eventually went to work in the pit, um, I went to the stables where the ponies were kept. And of course I can remember the things like the skull cap, and they were worn by the ponies to prevent them from um, injuring themselves on any low uh, beams. Um, and I can remember them coming out of the pit to go to the blacksmith's shop to be shooed uh, or have the, the hoofs clipped. Uh, of course, that was an industry in itself. And I think this is where the mice came from, is because when they used to take the straw down into the stables from, from the surface down in the underground, the mice used to be in the straw. And this is probably where the mice came from. And a, a big thing about the coal, the coal industry was, of course, was the, um, were the uh, workshops. And every area had a central workshop where machines came out to be overhauled. Um, there was a massive number of apprentices working, both electrical and mechanical apprentices, uh, employed by the coal board. And here's a, a, a showcase showing some of the instruments that would have been used by the apprentices. Um, the calipers and markers and mole grips. You know, it's it's only a small representation, but at least it's an acknowledgement that um, uh, you know the industry trained some excellent mechanics and electricians. It had an excellent uh, training program, and it was through the National Coal Board that I got a degree in engineering. Uh, because they had a, a superb uh, education system. Well, I have to say that although it's a compact museum, it does, in fact, uh, encompass lots of um, items that bring back so many memories to me as an ex-mining engineer. And as I said earlier on, I think it's a tribute to the people who first got together uh, to save something, um, to save part of the heritage for the future.